Hello, my name is Tyler, and you join me today on the Professor Podcast again. In today's episode, I'm joined with head teacher of Arbroath High School, Mr. Uh, Bruce Bandrich. So, hello, Mr. Bandrich. Hello. hello. Um, so, first of all, could you tell me a bit about where you grew up, what education was like for yourself growing up? I grew up, I was born in Dar es Salaam in what was then Tanganyika, it's now become Tanzania. Yeah. Um, and then I uh, moved from Dar es Salaam to Nairobi and spent a little time in Uganda, but mostly Nairobi. And then came back to the United Kingdom and lived in Dundee and then in Barry in, uh, in Angus. And so I've been to schools in uh, Africa. My nursery school was in Nairobi and then primary school in Nairobi and then uh, Downfield Primary in Dundee, followed by Barry Primary, uh, followed by going back to Africa. Mm. And, uh, I went initially to a boarding school in Muffet in Kampisha. Um, and after that, I went to an international school. It was called the International School of Lusaka in Zambia. Mm. Uh, there are actually, I think, two or three international schools, but mine was the real one. And uh, <clears throat> then came back to the United Kingdom in S3, in third year. And I went around all of the schools in Dundee uh, because my parents wanted me to go in at the same level mm. as I'd left. Um, but they all suggested I should drop back a year because I was quite young for my year. Mm. Um, and they were anxious that I'm the kind of person, if I'm not pushed to work hard, I might not mm. deliver the goods, as it were. So in the end, I went to the high school of Dundee, as it, it's called, Dundee High School. Um, then I left that partway through sixth year and went to college to, to take some A-levels and things like that. And then on to university, so quite a varied educational yeah. career. Um, I hope you don't mind me asking, why was your family living in South, uh, in Africa? My father is uh, was a planning and telecommunications engineer, so yeah. he planned phone networks. He'd been in the um, army in North Africa, so I think yeah. he, he, um, he used to talk about having itchy feet. He got used to traveling and seeing the world. And so he applied for, I mean, this is going back to a, an era and a very controversial aspect of British history to mm. the colonial mm. era. And so he applied to the colonial service and mm. uh, they were very rigorous in their selection processes. But you can imagine if you're trying to develop a country and uh, communicate, yeah. someone who can plan communications networks is, is really uh, uh, at a premium. So he went uh, I, initially to Nairobi and then to Dar es Salaam and worked there and really planned a lot of the network in uh, Tanganyika. Tanganyika was a British protectorate because it was originally originally a German colony, oh, yeah. and it was taken over yeah, after because the I First think World War. Namibia and I think Togo. I think it was originally called Togoland, but they changed that. And then yeah, Tanzania they were all German colonies. Yes, yeah. and so the British got it after yeah. the First World War. Um, so the infrastructure was quite good, and my father was really extending that mm. and developing that. Now mobile phones, it would be a completely different world. And I'm not sure they would need him as much. Well, I suppose he designed systems that would allow them to create mobile phone networks rather than landlines. Yeah. So he would go into the bush up country or whatever. He had various expressions for three or four weeks uh, and survey and would take a team and they'd work out how they could put in a phone network. He worked with a few colleagues who would work out how you could get power to the phone network yeah. because... You can't just have phones, you need to power them. Yeah. Um, I think he loved it because it was pioneering. Mm. There wasn't the same here. He'd done a bit in the Highlands where yeah. you know, a, a remote village might get a phone. It's hard for us to imagine you know, where there would be one phone and uh, people would go to that phone yeah. or you would phone an operator who would let you know when you could, you could use a line and so on. So he'd done a bit of that in the UK, but, but Africa was yeah. a huge area development and change that he loved. Yeah, what differences did you see with like going to school in, uh, was it Tanzania and Nairobi compared to what it was like here? Um, I, I think it was very traditional um, and a, a kind of English bias in places like Kenya and, yeah. and Tan Tanganyika. Um, inevitably because of the weight of numbers and so on, although Scots have always been a very significant presence abroad as you know, there are many yeah. more of us in other countries than there are in Scotland. Yeah. It used to make me laugh because if you went to a Caledonian society, you'd meet someone who'd been three generations in Africa and they were more Scottish yeah. than someone who'd never left our road. Yeah, I think um, I read somewhere that like, is it like 30 million Scottish and Irish people live in like Canada, New Zealand, South Africa. And they are so proud of their traditions yeah. and they're much more interested, I think, in bagpipes and in 
Robert Burns and all the things that go with being Scottish than most Scots yeah. because we didn't have to try very hard, just immersed in it in a way. Uh, so the schooling was was um, uh, good, I think. Um, my uh, nursery school, I went to, my mother volunteered in a nursery school uh, which was for Africans, you might say, and I went to that initially. And then I went to a nursery called, school called Lady Nordy. Um, and again, it was such a mixed group of young people, so it was more the clientele. Uh, the folk across the road from us in Nairobi were Americans uh, at my nursery school and primary school. It was a real mix of nationalities. Yeah. And, and whilst the education system was mostly modelled on the British education mm. system. On the other hand, by the time I got to Zambia, the international school, uh, they were all American. It was an American-run school. My uh, head teacher was called the principal, DJ Quimby. Um, and he, um, the whole school was modelled around uh, a United States version of education. Yeah. I was in grade seven, eight, nine, and going into grade ten, and so yeah. on. So, in that way, it was very different. Mm. I had a locker buddy. It, uh, you know, the language was very different. Yeah. Expectations were different. Interesting that it was corporal punishment. You could be caned, believe it or not. Um, and Warriston was a boarding school in the borders. That was again a different regime altogether with prep and and uh, the routine of a life where your home life is replaced by an institution. Yeah. Um, it was humane enough, although bullying was, was a bit like social media today. It was 24-7 mm. if someone didn't like you because yeah. you actually lived with them. Mm. And, and I don't know if that's, you know, in terms of the curriculum, yeah. um, I think I suffered a bit. Subjects like maths, modern languages, um, I, th I think those are the two main ones. Um, the continuity wasn't yeah. as strong as it needed to be. Uh, but the international Zambia. I would age. have imagined like subjects like modern languages would have um, definitely changed with the each <coughs> Well, yes. Yeah, so my uh, when I lived in um, um, Nairobi, um, I really grew up learning Swahili. So I spoke yeah. Swahili before I spoke English, mm. which I think shocked my parents a bit. My first words were in Swahili, mm. and they were quite hoping I'd say "mummy" or "daddy" rather than <laughs> "kwaheri" or "jambo" or. Whatever, Santi Sana. Yeah. And so I learned Swahili. And my father had learned what's called key Swahili. So he learned the correct Swahili. Mm. Swahili is phonetic language, so spelling is quite easy. Yeah. Jambo is spelled J E B. Yeah, it's so. the only word I, I recognize yeah, from that means hello. From, yes, oh, yeah. that's right. Well, and how are you? Yeah. And, um, and of course, we all know it from Lion King because yeah. it's used in that. Uh, but I spoke kitchen Swahili, it's called. So I spoke the Swahili everyone understood. Yeah. So very often I would have to translate his version for folk who uh, were coming around the house or whatever, mm. because I spoke the language they did. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I learned a language early on, but yes, that continuity, maths to switching curriculums yeah. and different emphasis, whereas history, English, uh, geography, even science, the skills are more generic. It was easier for me to keep up and yeah. do well in those. Well, I know in particular in the US, they have really strict laws on how they teach things like science or RME. Yeah, 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 they do. Um, my school became attached in Zambia to a, a Baptist um, mission school, and they contributed quite well. I have to say, it was great fun in some ways because the Americans were very modern in many respects mm. in their thinking about education compared to what I've been used to. So our music class consisted, and this really dates me, of um, practicing and singing Simon and Garfunkel songs, mm. and, uh, really very much up to the minute yeah. stuff. So that was great fun. And in science and in general, their, we would call it pedagogy, their approach to learning, uh, from my experience, seemed incredibly relaxed mm. and um, uh, very motivating and yeah. so on. Um, it wasn't all like that, though, as I say, there was corporal punishment and they were very strict about discipline in the international school. Mm. Uh, and I think that's probably a characteristic of a lot of American schools, yeah. that it's an interesting contrast and. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's not just a simple, uh, it's different. Yeah. It's a different ethos and culture. I think there used to be an American school in Aberdeen. Yeah. Because uh, mm -hmm. there's one in London and there used to be one in Aberdeen that's just now called the International School of Aberdeen. Is it? Yeah. Right. But in my class in, in Zambia, mm. I, I could be getting this wrong. I think there, were, there was a class of 29 and there were 27 nationalities. Mm. So people were really from all over the world. Yeah. And although it was an American school, uh, there were only three or four Americans, yeah. the rest were from um, all over Europe, uh, South America, all over Africa, yeah. a reasonable number of 
um, local Zambians. Right. Um, it was fee paying um, a lot of contracts and work abroad. The fees are partly paid. Mm. So I suppose you, I, I was in with some quite rich people, a lot of amb embassy folk. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, of course. Interesting group of people. Yeah. Which language would you say was like more used? Um, was it Swahili or English? Well, or? in Zambia, it, oh gosh, they have quite a few languages. Yeah. Bemba, I think, was the main one. Uh, in um, uh, uh, East Africa, Swahili was definitely a very yeah. um, usable language. Most, if mm. not all, spoke Swahili. Um, I wish my father was here to remind me. He'd be quickly correcting me on lots of things because uh, he, he used to think I was quite fanciful about how things actually worked in Africa. And I suppose that's inevitable if you are a child. For me, it was sunshine and bush and yeah. uh, swimming and so on. If you work in a setting like it's quite different. Dar Salaam was very arduous. Yeah. Um, temperature 90 degrees, humidity 90%. So you were, I, I stopped off there on my way back from boarding school um, and uh, it was a VC-10, the plane, they had to cover the engines and if you, I had, I, I stayed for a while um, and I stayed for a while with some friends in Nairobi, uh, but in Darslan I was so aware, I mean it was just so humid, you felt yeah. exhausted because you're coming from Scotland. Yeah, so into really that. the contrast, oh, yeah. It was huge, absolutely yeah. huge. But when I was born there and lived there, I, it was just what I was used to, mm. uh, but I think working in Mm. It's quite hard, and this is before the days of commonplace sort of air conditioning. Yeah. Um, many offices were just very well shaded and open windows to get a breeze. Um, but the, all the streets, I remember Darcelan, the streets were called things like Oyster Bay and Ocean View and so on. It sounds lovely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have pictures of it. I should go back and again and see what it's like. Yeah, I was just about to ask there. You mentioned you had friends there. Have you ever been back to see them? Or? Um, I haven't been back since my teens. Mm -hmm. um, I, I should go. I'm, I'm pretty certain when I retire, I'll go back to Africa. The thing about so many parts of um, Africa is they're quite volatile. But yeah. fortunately, Tanzania has been reasonably stable. Yeah. Kenya has its moments, but it's reasonably stable. Yeah. Uh, and Zambia is actually. Mm. Um, if you get too into the politics, you can ask questions about just how democratic they are. But yeah. So yes, I could go back and um, we used to travel through South Africa and the oh, holiday yeah. in what was then called Southern Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. Oh, yeah. So I would like to revisit these places. They say going back that you know you have a perception of where things are. Yeah. Um, but there's a saying when we lived in Africa, we used to say if you've drunk the waters of Africa, you'll always go back. Yeah. People used to joke about that and say, if you're drunk, you might also be very unwell for a while. <laughs> but, you know, you have to yeah. be clear of being there to go. So I will go back. Yeah. I'm young enough to want it. Apart from there, was there any other places, like um, abroad or exotic, that you've been there? Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, I suppose I've travelled in Europe and yeah. um, I haven't been to the States, interestingly. I'd, oh. I'd love to go there. Um, I think probably to travel through them, my, um, both my sons have been in my older son he really loves the states and yeah. he's traveled a lot he's done that kind of east coast west coast mm. across uh, stuff so i'd like to go there um so it's mostly been africa europe you know greece germany yeah. uh, france spain obviously and, and i've been to the canary islands when you um, live in africa you often sail back so initially we sailed back through the suez canal this oh, makes yeah. me feel really old on things like the kenya which became an education ship yeah. um, so the Kenya, the Naivasha, the Tanganyika, they were all named after the places. And it was the British India Line yeah. because they were on their way to India and connecting back to the UK. And then laterally from South Africa. So we would sail up mm. the west coast of Africa um, uh, and then you'd stop off at Las Palmas or yeah. something. So I, I suppose very much of my past in my adult life, it's been holiday yeah. trips rather than working. I did consider working in Africa. Mm. I didn't. I was just about to ask the about travel between Scotland and Africa, what it was like. Because I remember speaking to, it was the brothers who owned the Petrol Chili, and they were talking mm -hmm. about how it was getting to the LA to see their family. Yes. So, mm -hmm. um, what was it like going uh, between? Well, I loved yeah. it, and uh, boarding school was great, yeah. because you were um, felt very grown up, you yeah. were travelling yourself. Um, it was jet travel, so it was fast yeah. enough. My parents initially went out in planes that stopped off in places like Khartoum, and uh, you know, uh, really exotic yeah. uh, prop, uh, you know, propeller aircraft with very large seats and lots of space. I think my father even one, once went out on a flying boat of all things. Um, but yeah, it was jet aircraft and um, I 
think I love the independence. Um, oh, yeah. I remember once we were in the plane and the hostess said first class was more or less empty at the moment. And I was traveling with people from my school, but I also knew the, you know, the country and yeah. there was some friends who lived in Nairobi. And they moved us forward and served us chocolate eclairs. Um, and we were looking down on the Nile and the snaking through yeah. the desert. And it seemed to me near perfection. Yeah. Um, if I'm allowed to say it, very beautiful hostesses serving me chocolate eclairs <laughs> while I looked down at the desert. It was a very appealing thing. It's fantasy in a sense, because yeah. of course you land and real life begins again. But yeah, it was great. Mm. And I enjoyed the little bit of traveling on the boats that I did. Again, mm. my parents and my brother did far more. Um, it's lovely. It's a different world. I mean, it was very much about cruising. Now, these boats were carrying cargo, mm. mail, taking people back and forth to their jobs. Yeah. Uh, very often people would bring their cars. I mean, my father was an enthusiast for British cars, so our car would be on the boat and would be lifted off or lifted on and so on. And, um, it I, I was travel in the sense of a journey where you explored. Yeah. And whilst I don't remember a huge amount about it, you can imagine through the Suez Canal and through the Mediterranean, the boat would stop off at, stop off at various places, yeah. Spain and Italy and so on. And uh, much fun was had. Mm. I have some cine film. Have you heard of sort of? Uh, a cine photography where um, I have me in the past, mm. which I haven't worked out for ages, but it makes me laugh to see myself, the little me in the United States. You mentioned there uh, about ships that obviously are still really important. I remember, was it the Suez Canal, the cargo ship got stuck there, and that almost made the entire world stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a remarkable yeah. piece of engineering. Um, boats were much smaller then. Yeah, but the Kenya, I think it's was I think I think burnt out uh, nine thousand tons or something nothing like the tonnage of these enormous vessels. Yeah. The latter it was um, Union Castle SAF Marine it was the line and uh, I think that was a South African line and mm. like Union Castle British line and they were up around thirty thousand tons, but quite rough at times pre uh, stabilizers. So I remember being on the Olangi it was called a um, uh, South African named ship and. Um, we were all so seasick, it was the roughest, roughest sea. And when you walk, the deck would disappear below your feet yeah. and then you reappear. And I was feeling so sick, I went to the very front of the boat, went out of the door onto a, you know, this sort of protective line of windows yeah. facing out, and stood with the wind in my face and felt much better. And when my parents heard what I had done, they were horrified, because of course you can imagine, you'd be yeah. just blown away. Yeah. The, the waves were coming over the bow. Um, dramatic stuff. Mm. Um, I was never so relieved when it calmed down. Some folk in the first class swimming pool, which was inside the ship, were washed out and broke arms and legs. It was so rough. Yeah, it was extraordinary. And did you always want to become a teacher? Or? Uh, no, I, I went to university to do economics and did economics. And then I... Uh, and where was that? Uh, uh, Dundee uh, University. And I um, uh, did a degree in English and history then. And I decided I still wanted to pursue my economics and I went to work for Midland Bank initially in London, um, whether it was the streets are paved with gold or whatever appealed to me. There was a thing called the milk round where employers came around universities and would set up stall and you would go around them all. So I tried Marks and Spencers, uh, the civil service, uh, various banks and so on. And, um, British Airways, I, I went and uh, went down for a three day selection process. Um, and in the end, the graduate trainee scheme that appealed the most was the Midland Bank one, mainly because it was incredibly generous. It was very well paid from the start and um, they put you in accommodation for, initially they said three months, but I think they could have stayed even longer in a nice hotel in London. So naively as a student, I thought, well, this, what could go wrong? Yeah. Uh, so that's what I did initially. But I was also doing some research on the 4th Battalion Black Watch, um, Dundee's Aim, they're called, uh, with a... Uh, former lecturer, Bill De Spear, and so I was doing an MPhil at the same time as working for the bank. <clears throat> and um, I did a summer school yeah, yeah. at Dundee University where I um, lectured students, and it decided me that banking really wasn't for me. I wasn't as enthused. Again, the states, this is pre-Big Bang. Have you heard of Big Bang? It's a, re a reference to the freeing up of financial institutions. Yeah. To trade and to behave rather differently from the way we had before so it was quite restricting there wasn't the big money to make in the same way mm. so i um 
I predate that, which makes me old. Um, I think if it had been that era, I might have chosen to stay in London. Yeah. Uh, some of my friends who stayed in the bank, I mean, they really did so well financially. And so, uh, so I did my own film, trained to be a teacher, and the rest, as they say, is history. And um, what changes have you seen in education in your career? Um, in some ways, huge changes. Um, in other respects, secondary school has remained very similar to the way it was when I was at school. Mm. Um, a timetable that fragments the curriculum, um, very much about door shutting individual teachers, um, a huge increase in the amount of support given to children with learning difficulties. Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, so that's changed. The curriculum has changed. There's no question that the courses when I was at school were very, very traditionally yeah. academic route or non-academic. So I sort of straddle that comprehensive period. Mm. Uh, a few years younger and I would have gone through an 11 plus process and so on, or a few years older rather. Um, so the curriculum has changed. I think discipline is very different. Yeah. When I went to school, it was the belt. When I first qualified, it was the last year of the belt. I didn't use it myself. Couldn't quite believe when you're on the delivery end of it, it's a bit of a shock to you. Yeah. Hang on, it's a, you know, it's just bizarre. Uh, but a um, whole generation before me, so that's a massive change. Mm -hmm. um, curriculum for Excellence was probably the biggest change, which now happened uh, quite a long time ago, more than gosh, I'm trying to think, 2006, six seven was when it started. Um, and that did change things. It was much more then about skills and trying to develop uh, the kind of dispositions in young people. So we moved from my first teaching experience an imposition model where you made people do things and it was very much yeah um, so i'd argue it was better but you know it was about imposing discipline mm. uh, to a much more disposition model trying to develop and grow <coughs> the right attitudes and values and approaches and whatever people might say for all that the belt and so on schools were not necessarily a lot easier they were they were there's an awful lot of difficulty and challenge in classrooms as well um, and I suppose the other change <coughs> in education has been a recognition that young people need to have a voice. They need to yeah. be able to, to give their views on their education mm. on their own. Um, and then there's definitely a massive change in what happens after school. Yeah. And apprenticeships and university and college, a huge expansion. The number of people who go into what we would call tertiary. And that has changed secondary because um, children stay on longer, mm. more stay on longer. And then they don't leave for a job. Uh, one of the traditional industries have long truly yeah. gone. Um, when I first I taught at Webster's for a while, and it was still quite traditional in terms of where people went mm -hmm. you know, to jobs and so on. So Webster's is that in Kirimu? In Kirimu, yeah. 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 Um, so it, the, I suppose if I look at it, a lot has changed, but the fundamentals of the way a secondary works haven't. I wish they had in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it makes sense to fragment the curriculum the way we do. 50 yeah. minutes of maths, 50 minutes of PE, 50 minutes of English, 50 minutes of history, whatever, you know, it's yeah. mental gymnastics. Um, so that hasn't, but what's being done in those lessons, the way it's being done, the interest in what we've got pedagogy, how children learn, uh, cooperative learning is one of the techniques that people cry about. Um, as I say, the involvement of children in their own learning, the actual courses they do, um, and then the comprehensive system where they you can do a mixture of academic and practical and less academic courses in a way that we just think is like eating and breathing almost, but it wasn't quite so uh, much a given when mm. I first joined the profession. Clearly that's all the time we have left for us, so I'd like to thank you for watching and thank you Mr Bandwich for joining me. Thank you very much, I've enjoyed the chat, well, thank you. Yeah, and thank you and I will see you next time.